everyone, let's talk about transmission line junctions. So I just want to imagine, if you will, uh, a parallel wire transmission line. Okay, so you have two wires that are sort of side by side, and we know that there is some characteristic impedance associated with that, which will satisfy the square root of L prime over C prime. And that inductance slash capacitance is a function of the physical geometry of those wires and the voltages between them. Uh, so what will happen now is suppose that I take those wires and I open them up, kind of like I've, what I've drawn here. Okay, So what will happen here is by sort of moving the wires apart, the inductance and the capacitance between these two leads will change. So what that manifests as from a transmission line perspective is the characteristic impedance will adjust uh, very suddenly from this uh, original Z0 value to this new Z sub 1 value. So schematically, we're going to just represent that as the following. Like so. So you imagine a transmission line Z0, and then you just have another transmission line, and you give it a notion of Z1 here. So just remember in your mind, it when you draw it as a schematic, there, there's a tendency to ignore the fact that the geometry is physically changing here, um, even though we draw it as if it's parallel, okay? So, so this is physically what might happen. This is how we represent it in sort of an abstract schematic sense. So I'm just gonna put a little zero here for uh, my position, my origin of my coordinates here. And just bear in mind, these are capital Zs, and we use a lowercase z <laughs> uh, to indicate my my spatial position here. So try not to confuse my lowercase z here with my capital Z's over here. So what I'm interested in, in understanding is what happens if I excite this, uh, this transmission line here with some incident signal like uh, V naught plus. Um, physically, what will happen? So there's actually a you know, pretty straightforward derivation for what will happen here. And that is you'll get a transmitted signal over here and then you'll get a reflected signal back. And again, the proof is a little bit long and you've probably seen some of this before, but the upshot is that if you imagine this line going on forever, then from the perspective of the incident line here, this will simply behave as some lumped load, okay? So what you get is a reflection coefficient gamma which is going to be Z1 minus Z0 over Z1 plus Z0, like that. So you notice it looks exactly like the same reflection coefficient for a lumped load. And the derivation for that is pretty straightforward. So we're just kind of skipping to the end here uh, because what we really want to focus on is this transmitted wave over here. So the question then is, how do I calculate the amplitude of this little guy here? So I'm going to call this V sub 1 plus over here. Whereas remember, this might be V0 minus. So let's just write out the functional form for all the, the, the signals here to the left of this boundary. So I have V of Z tilde is equal to V naught plus times E to the negative J beta. And I'm going to put a sub zero here to represent the, the original transmission line. Sub Z or, or sub zero Z uh, plus gamma e to the plus j beta sub zero z like that. And I'm going to make a little note here. Z is less than or equal to zero. So that's all the, the waves to the left. So you notice we have an incident wave plus uh, the reflected wave in this region to the left. And then there's some transmitted wave over here. And if that feels a bit ad hoc, then just remember this is kind of how you have to do partial differential equations. Anytime you're solving a wave equation, what you do is you just sort of assume some form for your solution and you impose a boundary condition. And if everything satisfies your boundaries and the Helmholtz equation, then that's your answer. So if it feels a little bit like I'm just sort of imposing certain things, then that's just sort of how <laughs> partial differential equations works. So in the right, I'm gonna impose the assumption that maybe there is a wave traveling to the right. So I'm gonna call it V naught plus E to the negative J beta one z like so okay so what happens at this boundary now is i'm going to impose continuity like so continuity on the voltage 
So if you've taken partial differential equations, you remember this is a very common thing to do because the voltage a teensy weensy bit to the left cannot just spontaneously change from the bit to the right. There are two wires they're touching, so they have to have the same potential at that point. Whether or not I'm a nanometer to the left or a nanometer to the right shouldn't change things significantly. So one way you write that is just say V of zero minus is equal to V of zero plus. <clears throat> Sorry, this here should say z is greater than or equal to zero to indicate the signal in the right. So this is the continuity condition, which basically says this is the signal just a hair to the left evaluated at zero is going to have to equal this one here evaluated at zero. So all you'll get is v naught plus times, so I'm just putting in zero here, and I will get one plus gamma, right, is equal to v one plus, and that's it, right? So that is my continuity condition. But what I'm gonna do now is take the ratio of these two terms over here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And I will get V1 plus divided by V0 uh, plus. So this is the transmitted wave into the second line divided by the incident is going to equal one plus gamma. So this, this ratio here has a special name and it is called a transmission coefficient. So let's write that down, transmission coefficient. So it's perfectly analogous to the reflection coefficient where you had the ratio of the reflected wave uh, relative to the incident wave. Now I have the transmitted wave relative to the incident wave. So this has a, a, a dedicated letter and your textbook uses a capital T for that Personally, I kind of hate that. I would rather use a tau. That's how a lot of other references uh, tend to denote this coefficient. So this is your textbook. This is what I may accidentally use from time to time if I'm not careful, but there should be pretty obvious from the context. So tau is equal to one plus gamma, or you could just say capital T is one plus gamma. <clears throat> now remember that gamma here has a, a, a expression that we could calculate based on this junction here. So I'm just going to sub that, substitute that into here. So you get one plus gamma and you do some algebra. Okay. It's a very, very, you know, straightforward manipulation. But if you solve for that, you will find that tau is equal to two times Z one divided by Z one plus Z naught. Okay. So this is one of those little equations, very similar to this one up here that <clears throat> you should just kind of, you know, remember and have memorized because it's going to come up a lot from time to time. Okay. But that's essentially all that happens at the junction between two transmission lines. You get a reflection and a transmission. The reflection coefficient follows the exact same form as what we typically had before. And then you get this transmission coefficient here. And remember, this is a special case where this is supposedly going on and on forever. Eventually what will happen, is we're going to impose say a condition like this where there's some load here plus the line and we're going to calculate the input impedance over to here and again the, the reflection coefficient will have no idea what's happening here all it will see is some equivalent z in here when it uh, evaluates to that uh, or when you figure out the reflected uh, amplitudes and so on okay <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit more about that later